Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, we'll give it another minute before we begin. Just some uh, housekeeping uh, questions. I mean, how, housekeeping rules. If you all could utilize the Q and A function to ask um, any questions, um, and we will uh, monitor that. Okay. Okay, good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Mike Way. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I serve as a health equity lead with Sacramento County Public Health. In lieu of National Public Health Week, we have a series of Zoom presentation this week on various topics such as climate change, accessibility, and racism. I wanna thank you all uh, for your dedication to this field and attending our session today. Uh, again, uh, just a gentle reminder, a few housekeeping items before I hand it over to our wonderful speaker are that all participants are automatically placed on mute until the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions, please type it into the chat and our chat moder moderator, Melissa Ricks, will either uh, answer your question in the chat or save it to the Q&A portion um, and answer with our guests at the end. Without further ado, I have the honor to introduce our powerful speaker, Dr. Flo Jean Griffin Kofer. Dr. Kofer is an epidemiologist who serves as the Senior Director of Policy for Public Health Advocates. She manages a team of staff leading health equity initiatives focused on California state policy, boys and men of color, my, brother, my brother's keeper, community-based 911 response, first response transformation, youth trauma prevention in cities, all children thrive, and most recently public health response to COVID-19, California COVID justice recovery response repair. Her professional, her professional interest um, is addressing the emerging and persistent public health challenges through research policy and community engagement. Her work primarily focuses on public health prevention. Prior to joining public health advocates, she led the preconception health initiative at the California Department of Public Health. Dr. Kofer received her bachelor's degree in chemistry and women's study from Spelman College. Her public health training was at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, where she earned her master's in public health and a doctorate in epidemiology. She's an alumna of California Epidemiologic Investigation Service and the Nehemiah Emerging Leaders Program. Please give me a warm, um, please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Kofer. Thank you so much, Mike, for that really warm introduction. And I tried not to uh, feel embarrassed throughout all of it. There's this very human way that um, we all, I think, feel a little bit embarrassed when people talk about us and we have to sit there and receive our flowers. So I'm learning to accept that. Uh, thank you all for being here today and for this opportunity to be able to talk about a topic that is incredibly important um, and also one that I think we don't have enough conversation around. And so my goal today is to make this conversation accessible for us to start by talking about a pop culture kind of figure from from you know the ways in which we we um, in, engage and talk um, through our movies and and music and 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 culture really um, and then take the lessons learned from entertainment and apply them to the really important work of better understanding our communities and then thinking about what role and responsibility we have to do something about the the conversation and do something with the information that's shared. So with that, I'm going to jump right into a talk that is about institutional racism as a community trauma. And while this, is, while this topic is heavy, I hope to bring a little bit of levity as, a, as an instructional tool to it um, without minimizing the seriousness of the topic that we are discussing. So for those of you who uh, have not, you know, been living under a rock for maybe the last like 40 years or so, uh, there is a series of movies that have made um, quite a lot of money called Star Wars. Uh, and so I am going today to walk you through one of the main characters, um, especially in sort of the first six uh, movies uh, of the series, uh, a character called Anakin Skywalker, who we are introduced to as Darth Vader. And if you have not seen Star Wars, I hope you're at least aware that 
that it exists. Um, but if you haven't seen it, you don't have to have seen it to, to understand any of what I'm going to talk about today. But if you have seen it, uh, I think you will probably not see Darth Vader quite the same in the future. Um, and if you're prone to overthinking your uh, entertainment as I am, then you may begin to see other characters that show up in, in our entertainment spaces um, in, a, in a slightly different light. So with that said, um, let's jump right into this. So when we think about Anakin um, and his progression to Darth Vader, we're going to start chronologically, not the way the movies are told. And so let's think about what happens to him in the early stages of his life. Um, when his mother is pregnant and around the time of his birth, he ends up being born a slave. And the only thing that we are um, told it, really about, you know, his parents' relationship is that his father's not around. Um, we can, you know, we can guess around why that is, but certainly slavery um, has a way of separating families um, and, and making the, the, the ability to be together uh, much more difficult. And then in his childhood, he remains a child slave. Um, and around the age of 10, he's taken from his mother to be trained as a Jedi. And it's really important that, um, that this is listed as a risk factor because in many, in, in many ways, taking him from his mother to be trained as a Jedi is a positive experience. And we'll talk about some of those protective factors, but he also is separated from his mother. And as a result, he has a strong sense of abandonment and heightened arousal and a fear of loss. And this is important to understand because even when some of our systems, you know, separate families for the purpose of foster care um, and, and child protection, we have to recognize that while that may be done in the best interest of a child um, to, to ensure their safety, it also results in a trauma and a loss and um, a separation. And that, that that has to be underscored and understood as being, um, you know, potentially necessary, but certainly also traumatic for that child. And so when we get to his adolescence, um, because of that separation, here are some of the positive things that happen. He has a trusted adult relationship with Obi-Wan Kenobi. And we have lots of information um, and, and bodies of, of research to demonstrate the, the importance of having a trusted adult relationship during critical parts of adolescence in terms of, of healthy development. He also gets a Jedi education. Again, robust you know, literature documenting how education increases lifetime earnings and, and, um, and also so extends life expectancy and does a whole host of other things to help with um, with our overall health and well-being. And he's freed from slavery, which I hope I don't have to convince anyone is a net positive. Um, yet at the same time, there also are some additional risk factors that now come about primarily because of his affiliation with the Jedi. He's now exposed to violence via the Clone Wars and he has ongoing family separation. So he's still not reunited with his mother, which is a chronic, a, 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 you know, a one-time trauma that becomes Becomes chronic and is, is an overarching um, theme to the story of his life. And so when we get to his adulthood, you know, his adulthood looks a lot like what we might expect for someone who has more risk factors than protective factors during those early stages of his life. He lacks trust in those around him. There are corrupting influences that, that really predominate his life, especially Sith Lord Sidious. He has an unplanned multi pregnancy. Spoiler alert, that's Luke and Leia. I mean, the movies have been out for like 30 years now. So I don't know if they needed a spoiler alert or if anybody's going to be mad at me for spoiling that. Sorry. Um, he has domestic violence in his marriage to Padme. He's severely burned. The Death Star explodes. So who knows what kind of environmental toxins he's exposed to. There's ongoing war around him throughout his, his adulthood. And then he prematurely dies. Usually at this point, there is a, um, a very avid Star Wars fan in the audience who is thinking to themselves, premature death. I saw episode six and the character that they revealed didn't look to be, you know, to have prematurely died to me in terms of what a normal life expectancy would look like and what someone would, who was aging would look like. Um, and so to that, I would say, well... Here is the chronological timeline of Anakin's life um, based on the scrolling text that start that, you know, very um, iconically starts the beginning of every single movie. And what you see is that at the end of episode six, chronologically, that person should only be 45 years old. Um, and I think that really speaks to a few things, right? I don't know if George Lucas did this intentionally, but certainly there's a body of work that talks about the role of stress and weathering, right? Arlene Geronimus's work around how if you experience um, 
from stress throughout your life, you actually begin to age faster than your chronological year, years. Um, your telomeres shorten. And so you are just rapidly moving through the aging process in a way that that would not necessarily be expected. And so while I think this was just simply one of those continuity errors, um, it certainly you know plays out that the person who was revealed at the end of episode six looks far older than 45. And in fact, as a person who's not yet 45, I frequently joke and, joke and say to people, if I look like that when I'm 45, somebody please check on me. I'm not okay. Something more than just my skincare routine and hydration has gone terribly wrong. But the other piece of this that I think we have to talk about is how the story is told. Because we meet Darth Vader at episode four of the story. And we are told episodes four, five, and six before we bother to go back to episodes one, two, and three and find out how he came to be, to learn about Anakin. We get glimpses of his life. It's so true that for many people, we meet them in episode four of their lives, but we don't have the same curiosity about the real life Anakin's that we do and Darth Vader's that we do about a fictional character. We wondered for almost 30 years, how did he become this person? We heard that he was this powerful Jedi and how did he you know, cross over to the dark side? And then we were told his origin story. And we need to apply that same curiosity to the people that we inter interface with every day. Not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you? What is your origin story? Because it'll be far more instructive in terms of what's happened to people and understanding how we may prevent that in future generations. But there's another piece of this story that I think is really important to lift up as well. And it's that there are, this isn't just an individual story. It's, it's, it certainly is Darth Vader's story, but there are systems that shaped and mostly failed Anakin. You know, education that was contingent on his military service, which furthered his trauma exposure. Why didn't Anakin get the mental health support he needed when it was clear that he was struggling? Why did political systems locally allow slavery and intergalactically perpetuate war? Um, where was the social safety net to help Anakin's mother achieve a goal of reproductive justice to be able to parent the child she had in dignity and safety? Um, what were the cleanup efforts in the environmental aftermath after the Death Star exploded? Um, what was her preconception and maternity care to prevent, you know, um, to, pre pre to prevent an unintended pregnancy? for both her as well as for Luke and Leia, um, which was not, you know, not, not an, a pregnancy that was, that was intended. Um, how we tell the story determines how we see the stories and who we consider to be the villain. Because I would argue that the bigger villain in all of this are all of the systems that failed Anakin and led to his premature demise and all of the harm that he then perpetuated, especially that was that which was perpetuated systematically that then creates a whole Whole new generation of people who have been traumatized. So while this story, you know, is, is fun to really overthink, it also deeply connects to what we see in real life. And I think that's why it's important to start with a fictional character and then think about how all of this plays out in real life and how differently we see things when they're not being presented to us for entertainment. So next, we, we move on to think about, you know, just defining trauma, right? Trauma is an event or a series of events or circumstances experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening that has a lasting, you know, adverse effect on their ability to function, their mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. So we, we, we often think about traumas as being individual. And so I just wanted to, to define them because sometimes the word trauma is thrown out and we haven't really kind of come to a, a common understanding of what we're talking about when we mean trauma. And so when we think about trauma, um, many of you have probably heard of, heard of a concept called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Um, and that really started out as being a really sort of narrowly defined set of circumstances that happened before someone turned 18 uh, that were um, learned you know, about 25 years ago to be associated with behavioral, physical, and mental health outcomes in adulthood. Um, ones that had previous to that study coming out not really been um, connected, especially things like diabetes and heart disease cancer and stroke um, that were associated with the things that happened to you in a critical window um, that those early life exposures that we, uh, we just talked about with Anakin and Darth Vader. And so, so we learned about these and we, we recognized that there was this, this relationship from what happens to an individual in a particularly sensitive time frame and how that plays out in their adult life. But one of the things we also have to include in this 
is what's happening in the broader societal context. And so we can't just think about trauma as something that a person experiences. We also have to think about trauma as something that a community experiences. And so, so when we think about community trauma, we're talking about members of a collective who are subjected to a horrendous event that importantly marks their group consciousness. So they, they begin to understand themselves and the world around them through this event, and it shapes their memories and changes their future identity in fundamental and irrevocable ways. And so there are lots of examples of community traumas that occur that, you know, when you hear the term Sandy Hook, you no longer think of a city if you don't live there, you think of an event, right? That has shaped their consciousness um, and it has, it has been embedded into their memories and their future identity is tied to this. Um, Chernobyl is another example, right? When we, sometimes a community becomes defined by a particular event. And so it's important for us to recognize that that happens and we often will identify those traumas. Pearl Harbor is another example, but what, what about the traumas that are not so recognized that they become synonymous with a place? What about the, those other traumas that are experienced by a community that we often overlook? And how, how do we then conceptualize that and think about the support that a community needs? And also, how do we begin to think about what actually happened and the long-term impact of it? So when we're thinking about, you know, ACEs as adverse childhood experiences, we also can think about ACEs as adverse community experiences. And these are, you know, going to be focused on our communities, our institutions, and our society, but they have the same impact on our longevity and our overall well-being. And so they can't be overlooked. They, it, we have to think about both the individual and the individual as part of a collective and how that shapes their health, well-being, um, and risk factors. So... When we think about, you know, COVID-19, because I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk at this point about, you know, COVID, one of the things that we heard, especially a, a lot in the first, you know, year, year, year and a half of the pandemic is we're in this together. And I would say to myself, that is true. We are in this together. This is a global pandemic. So there are no human beings on the planet that are not, you know, likely impacted by this in some way. And yet, let's take the example of the Titanic right? A sinking ship. And so any passenger on the Titanic could say, we're all in this together, very literally. And I would say, sure, but more third-class passengers died than first-class passengers. Men died more than women and children. So therefore, first-class women were most likely to survive compared to third-class men. And the reason for that was because of social stratification, because of class, because of gender, because the limited availability of lifeboats was then reserved for women and children because of social structure. And those women and children that it was reserved for were mostly first class women and children. And so that was who was most likely to survive. And we saw that exact same pattern play out in COVID in terms of who was suffering and who experienced the greater burden of disease. So looking just at Sacramento County data as an example, right? The dual pandemics of COVID-19 and what we will talk about as structural racism we're compounding the harm experienced by our communities of color. And so even though the case load overall in raw numbers was predominantly white because the, the county population is, when we look at actually the case rates, so how many people per population, we tell a very different story. And we see the disparities for all of our communities of color as compared to our white community, recognizing that for over a, for almost a third of the cases, we don't even have a known race or ethnicity. So these disparities could be even higher. And so this brings us to understanding the social determinants of health, because we have to now recognize that you know, the social, the conditions that we're in, these social conditions in the physical and economic environment throughout your life play an important role in shaping your health and your disease patterns that we see across communities. Environment here, you know, is not just defined as the physical environment, but it's broadly defined to include, not, to include safe housing and areas for recreation and availability of nutritious foods and clean air and water, and as well as social and economic factors like race and poverty status of families and communities, job opportunities, um, violence, external stress, um, the capacity of the community to engage in change, 
um, transparency of our systems. All of those are ways in which we um, are thinking about our social determinants of health. And all of these are ways in which we either promote health or we are increasing the risk factors in our communities to not live as long and to not have the same quality uh, of life during the years that we do live. So it, it's really important that we just underscore that the conditions in our environment are shaped by policy and systems. And so the result is that neighboring communities in many instances are worlds apart in terms of life expectancy. There are, there are bordering zip codes in, within the state of California that have a 20 year difference in life expectancy at birth. Um, and, and these are neighboring communities. Um, that is a travesty. We should not be able to predict um, with unfortunate accuracy who is going to live longer when infants are being born. Um, and that really speaks to what we need to, the, 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 the gravity of what we are contending with and what we need to be able to address to move forward. And so how this shows up is as health inequities, right? These systematic and unjust differences that we see in how long people live, how healthy they are while they live, um, that's often based on membership in an oppressed group. Um, and the reason for that is restricted access to resources. Um, these are, this is not natural variation. We should not see a 20 year difference in life expectancy between neighboring communities. And so using this example here that is drawn from the All Children Thrive Initiative of you know, there being a fence around the opportunity, the opportunity for life, the opportunity for, for well-being, um, we see lots of social factors that are, are responsible for being the fence around that opportunity. These are the forces that are driving inequality. And so our job really, if we think about the opportunity being, you know, in fenced is for us to tear down the, the fence and tear down the structure so it's not only available to a few people and make it accessible to all. So before I go into talking now about racism um, and, and using two examples to really talk about institutional racism and help us better understand it, I just wanna, want to, to mention intersectionality, right? This is a, a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw to really explain that we are not just one identity at a time. Um, for those of you who, um, are, who may be curious, I identify as a black woman, um, but I also happen to be, uh, you know, you walking us through this chart, um, a straight black woman who was raised in a Protestant household, who, you know, is part of the, the managerial class, who was college educated, who was born in the US, who speaks English um, natively and who is an able-bodied person, right? And so it is very easy for me to fall into the category of just black or just woman without, without acknowledging that I have lots of intersectional identities, some of which are going to be what we call one up identities, right? Those that are more privileged. And some of those are going to be one down identities. And so when I'm walking into a room, I'm not having the same experience as a black woman who, is, who potentially is not college educated, was born outside of the US, does not speak English natively, or has a disability. Um, and so just recognizing that even when I'm having this conversation and talking about the patterns we see with race, there also are intersectional patterns that we're going to see based on other identities that are going to color that experience. Um, so institutional racism is a broad category we're going to talk about now, but we certainly have to, have to also acknowledge um, the, the, the stratifications that occur even within a racial and ethnic group based on your privilege. So now we're going to define racism. Um, and when we're defining racism, we, it, it's, I think this is, a, this is the most critical of the definitions that I'm going to share today, because so often we think we know what we're talking about when we say racism. Um, but really, what we're often using is a very limited understanding of racism. Racism being um, something that happens interpersonally. Um, racism is something, is a, is a behavior, a feeling, and a, a personal characteristic. And that is certainly one of the ways that racism shows up. But Every level of racism sustains the racist system. And we need to understand more than just the interpersonal. Because if we are thinking about racism as something that we just root out in ourselves, we don't think about the ways in which our policies also perpetuate those harms, even when they have been rescinded. And that's part of what I'm going to share with you as some examples of the, the far-reaching ways that racist policies will continue to perpetuate themselves. So 
personally mediated racism. That's the racism we kind of all know, you know, it's individual insults and discriminatory acts and things that are happening between one another. It's the reason why people will say to you, well, I'm not racist, right? Um, that's a limited definition, but it doesn't include the ways in which there's cultural racism, right? Which determines, you know, which group qualities and characteristics are valued or devalued. When we think about things like colorism, right? The idea that having light skin, light hair, and light eyes is seen as a beauty norm, not just, you know, in, within the United States, but globally is a result of colonization, right? A small group of people in Western Europe who happen to have lighter skin, lighter hair, and lighter eyes colonized all but five to 12, depending on you count on how you count, countries on the entire planet. And so then looking like the people in power becomes of social and economic value. And so there is a reason why beauty norms are, are shaped in that way, even though most of the world's population is not light skinned, light haired and light eyed, right? And so that's an example of cultural racism. Um, internalized racism, right? When people then begin to accept, you know, the, the stigmatization um, that comes along with stereotypes around their abilities and their intrinsic worth. Um, and then there's the institutional racism, right? And this is where we have these racism race and class-based policies and practices, these things that can be informal or formal that are shaping how people live. And that's really the place I want us to focus because once put in place, other systems are built on top of them and they don't even need a bad actor at the top. They just need us to do nothing and allow what will happen to, to play out as planned and they will continue to perpetuate harm. And so it, it's really important that we recognize that when we're talking about systems, systems are also designed and maintained by people. So there can sometimes be a way where people throw their hands up and say, well, the system, well, the policy, well, we put all the policies in place and we have a responsibility to figure out how to change them and how to change these patterns. This is all human made. So our first example is housing. Um, for those who may be familiar, there was a period um, in the United States where we formally had a process known as redlining. It was the official practice of the Federal Housing Authority from 1934 to 1968, wherein they graded neighborhoods. And they, they graded these neighborhoods using a, a color and, and letter system. And so the green line neighborhoods were those that were considered the best. They were places where mortgages were backed, where business loans were approved, where businesses were encouraged to, to place their businesses, um, where, you know, the, the tree canopy was supported by, you know, by public funds, where, where lots of investment was taking place to be able to maintain the neighborhood. And they were also almost exclusively white. And then there was this, this sort of you know, gradation, all right? This system was based on white supremacy and proximity to blackness. And so the more people who were not white um, that showed up in a neighborhood, you might then be downgraded to a blue neighborhood um, or a yellow neighborhood, um, blue being still desirable, yellow being definitely declining and redlined neighborhoods were considered hazardous. And they were where primarily black and also Latino people were living. Um, and in some instances also indigenous folks. And the, the way these ratings were taking place was that if your neighborhood was considered to be redlined, there was, there was not to be mortgages back there. You were not to invest in those communities. You were really to leave them to themselves. And in fact, one of the things I like to remind people is that the build the wall movement did not originate with the Trump administration. It actually, it actually really is a, a relic of redlining that the, the practice was that if there was a green line community that was that was adjacent to a red line community, it was recommended that either you um, you try to separate them by some sort of boundary, like railroad tracks, which is where the colloquialism, the other side of the railroad tracks comes in, or by a freeway, which is why you will see in many communities freeways were run through and were the dividing line between red lined and green lined communities, those that were more affluent and those that were predominantly people of color and were disinvested and therefore were less um, financially affluent because of our policy decisions, not because of anything being wrong with the people who live there. Or if that was not possible, if the railroad or the freeway was not possible to build a wall to separate them so that there would be a boundary designating that these two neighborhoods are not to intermingle, um, are not the same and should not be regarded in the same way. And so it's important that we recognize that redlining officially ended in 1968. And yet when we look 50 years later in 2018, we see that two thirds of those redlined areas 
are still inhabited primarily by Black and Latino populations, that three quarters of them continue to struggle economically, and that 91% of the Green Line areas remain middle to upper income today, and that 85% are still predominantly white. So here we have a policy that was rescinded over two generations ago, and yet the impacts of it are still felt in terms of who lives where, and how much the houses are worth, and how, and what people are able to make in terms of their financial security. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that every year only about 2% of houses are sold. Um, if you happen to be fortunate to, and, and you know, and privileged to even own a home, um, especially if you were from a redlined community where mortgages were not backed. So if you rescind a policy in 1968, and let's say you happen to have a fortunate person in a redlined area who owned their home and was now prepared because the policy allowed them to move into another community, their home wasn't valued in the same way. They had not had the same economic experiences as people who were able to buy in those green line neighborhoods for 34 years. And so there's not now equity if you're not going to think about how you actually repair the past harm and instead just try to say, well, we did that, it's over, now we're moving forward. Moving forward still leaves people on an uneven landscape. So that's our first example, and we will build on that one, but I want to pivot uh, momentarily to think about the war on drugs, and in particular how a lot of it started with a focus on marijuana. And this quote from Harry Anglinger is probably quite upsetting to many people. I know it's upsetting every time I see it, but I think it's important for us to recognize that here is Harry Anglinger existing in this time after, you know, born after Reconstruction um, and, and moving his way through, you know, a time where, you know, various social movements are taking, taking hold, um, including the, the beginning of the civil rights movement right towards the end of his tenure. And he is really struggling with social stratifications. He's struggling with, you know, the race, race and ethnicity of the people in, in, um, in his in his country. Um, and he is blaming this as the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which is the, the precursor to the to the DEA. Um, he is blaming this on black people, Latinos, Filipinos and more broadly entertainers um, and and really talking about, you know, the social changes that he's seeing. He thinks that this is going to cause, you know, people to, to intermingle across race, but in particular, black men and white women. Um, and so this was this was his concern. He, he did not want marijuana to cause people to think that we, ha we should have some sort of social equality. Um, and so he headed this agency for the first 32 years of its existence. So here is where systems are supported by people. And so his prevailing notions of race and of drug use and how the two combine were basically the policy setters for, two, for almost two generations. And so we see right here that by 1952, he's able to get the Boggs Act passed, um, which sets mandatory sentences to two to 10 years for simple possession. And then the Daniel Act, which allows for an increase, right, on those penalties by up to eight times. So depending on the amount and circumstances, you could get up to 80 years for simple possession of marijuana. And then of course, what we often see is that the states then enact little Boggs Acts, right? They follow suit and do the same thing. So you have now these state and federal penalties for this, largely because of his prevailing notions, even though throughout this time, there was data that came out that just completely obliterated his argument about why this was necessary. In 1944, the New York Academy of Medicine came out with findings that said marijuana doesn't do any of the things that Anglinger was, was alleging it did, and he dismissed it outright. Um, and, and this happens throughout time where back and forth administrations, depending on prevailing notions and not actually science, were, de were deciding on drug policy because of their, their feelings about drugs and their ideas about race and ethnicity. And so our organization put out a report um, in 2020 that was called When the Smoke Clears. And uh, the idea was to think about the impact because in the 20 years prior to Prop 64, the Adult Use of Marijuana Act being passed, that we looked at who was arrested for marijuana use and 90% of those arrests were for simple possession. So going back to Anglinger, right, the long history of criminalizing simple possession um, goes back to that the, you know, the Boggs Act and the Daniel Act. And we saw that still happening from 2000, you know, from, from 1996 to 2016. What we also saw, though, were disparities in the arrest rates. And so across racial and ethnic groups, I really want to underscore this. 
people use marijuana at the same rate. It is, I, I sometimes jokingly say, the, the most American of all American things because it's something that we really don't see differences across any of our racial and ethnic groups. Everybody is smoking weed at about the same amount, um, at about the same rate. And yet, statewide, Black people were four times more likely to be arrested than white people. Um, and, and if we look more locally, in Sacramento, we unfortunately had the, the, we have the unfortunate designation of being the highest of disparity rates in the state with black Sacramento residents being arrested on marijuana related charges 29 times more often than white residents, which is seven times the state average, which was already bad. Um, so, so really looking at this and recognizing that we're seeing some major disparities because of the ways in which this policy plays out, which we'll talk about now. So the impact on the war on drugs was a community trauma, right? We incarcerated people and we separated families. And if you happen to get a felony conviction, it could jeopardize your immigration status, your child custody, your employment, your housing, your ability to access social services. So all of these other policies, again, are layered on top of the drug policy, which came about from an unscientific and just a notion of a man who, who was uncomfortable with you know, race and ethnicity um, and the changes that he was seeing in a country. That's the way that our, our prevailing notions can become policy and have a long lasting impact. But the question you might be asking yourself is like, well, how did, you know, how did Sacramento end up with this major disparity? Why are we seeing this racial disparity if everybody's using marijuana at the same rate? Well, redlining. Because if you have notions about who's using drugs and you require those people to live in segregated communities, it has been very easy to go in and criminalize people based on who you think is using drugs. You, you seek and you shall find. So you seek in neighborhoods where you think you will find. And then when you do, you arrest those people and you don't do the same seeking in other places because that's not who you have decided up front without any indication whatsoever or any data to support it is using these drugs. And so that's how the implementation of those laws ended up being racist in nature and really showing up it, with some major geographic disparities. And so if we look, right, the top five booking census tracts in Sacramento County also have median household incomes that are less than 60% of the state median income. And you'll likely see a map that you'll say, didn't she already show me this map earlier? Because if we, when we get later on, you'll see another map that looks almost identical to this, which will tie all of this together. So keep that in mind. So the impact of redlining then is that it set the stage for tons of other institutions to layer on top of it. So when we think about our schools, right? We often have neighborhood schools. And really up until the, you know, the we changed the local control funding formula, schools were largely funded by the tax base in their in their areas, which meant that. If you went to a segregated school, you had less money because redlining determined who lived where, and we already know what the financial implications of that were. Community maintenance. Um, the Sacramento Tree Foundation has a really great presentation showing that, you know, during times uh, of austerity, places that were more affluent like East Sacramento and even Land Park maintained their, their tree maintenance from the city where other communities did not, um, where the tree canopy was then allowed to fall away. And so it results in actually a higher um, a temperature during the summer, and which, which has a whole host of impact on, you know, on human behavior, as well as on our health and well-being of living in those communities. Um, even, even street maintenance and trash pickup and all of those things that we see happen very differently across communities. Food availability, right? In addition to not wanting to back mortgages in redlined communities, also businesses were not encouraged to, to place themselves there, which includes our grocery stores. So we still see food deserts in many of the communities that were, that were redlined, um, even to this day, because businesses have not been placed there. And so that really has an impact on people's access to fresh and healthy food um, and an overall life expectancy, diabetes rates, et cetera. And then community violence, right? It is known that when you concentrate people who are experiencing tons of trauma and also experiencing poverty into a place and you don't provide social supports and you continue to traumatize them through other systems, that the likelihood of violence goes up. It's not anything that is related to a person's individual identity or ethnicity or any of the, 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 the common prevailing notions that we have around why this happens. It is no, it happens around the world that there are conditions that increase 
police violence. And so the impact of redlining is that we created those conditions. Um, and then policing and incarceration. We've decided that, that communities are bad. We, we don't give them what they need. And so then we send in the police. And that's really the primary institution that is often interfacing with, with um, people who are not school age. And then, so the impact of this is, of course, health status. We talked about life expectancy already, but we see everything from hospitalization rates um, to overall quality of life measures, just, just showing disparities because of redlining, because of what we decide, where we decided people should live, and the fact that we did nothing about that policy. So all of these other things are built on top of redlining. So I, I mentioned to you before that I was gonna show you another map that was gonna look eerily similar to the marijuana arrest rate data. And these are, our, these are COVID cases, right? Very similar places we're seeing high rates of COVID because all of these systems are interlocking and they're shaping what's happening. So I mentioned earlier, you know, that there's a disproportionality in who is experiencing COVID and it is entirely explained by structural racism. Right, the historical and ongoing cycle that's driven by those social determinants of health that we talked about that increases your risk for infection, that increases your risk of complications because of both underlying health status, as well as where you're living, as well as what type of work you're doing, as well as your baseline stress, and an increased risk for the economic and social consequences of job loss and closures and school, uh, and school closures and business closures and all the things that are happening. Racism was the reason why, very predictably, public health people could tell you when a pandemic comes, here is who is most likely to be harmed. Because we already knew what the framework was, we just had to apply whatever the conditions were going to be. So the reason that I bring all of this up is because if you read headlines right here in Sacramento, you will see the evidence of this. These are all headlines pulled from the last two years. Just focusing on, you know, the, the first headline is, I'm not crazy why California Latinos carry more worries in the pandemic and why many don't get help. COVID shortens U.S. life expectancy with Black and Latino communities most hurt, study says. Gun assaults increased during the pandemic. See the trend in your Sacramento neighborhood. Something that our violence prevention experts told us in advance and requested money for, and we, we, we decided not to do that. We deprioritized that um, even though we should have, and it was known, it was predictable, similar to the ways in which a, pan a pandemic, if occurred, was going to impact our communities. Sacramento's tree canopy reflects the city's inequities, how a $250 million plan could help. The face of hunger, thousands can't afford to eat in Sacramento, how COVID made it worse. An updated fi report finds Sacramento City Unified suspends black students at an egregious rate. A wound that never closes, racism, public, uh, racism, police violence, and the toll on black mental health. So you can just see a snapshot of headlines from just the last year and a half to two years really demonstrates the long lasting impact of redlining. All of these things can be tied back to a, a policy that then future policies were built upon. And that's why we have to focus on institutional racism because if we don't go, if we don't actually address the harms, we don't then set ourselves up for future successes and everything we do in the future is built upon a, sh a shoddy foundation. So I would be remiss if I didn't just get a little bit into theory really quickly and talk about, you know, progressive prevention, right? Because we often act, and this is obviously a, a disease model, but, it, but it, it really applies across the board. We act when people are in crisis. We are not set up to think about prevention um, and to think about you know, remediation in the ways that we should. And so our healthcare system is set up this way. Our public safety system is set up this way. Like we respond, but we don't spend nearly enough time preventing. And so I just wanna drill home everywhere I go that it is really important for us to shift and think about prevention, whether that's you know, primary prevention right now of what can we do to stop things and also taking the lessons learned from what, we, what we've done and doing primary prevention for the the next generation. It is critical that we make these investments because we cannot continue to think that we're going to operate in the treatment and response phase and actually make a dent on some of the real challenges that we're facing. And that goes beyond a disease model to also think about our policy implications. So 
basically what we what we're really contending with is that we have to recognize and we have to address community trauma and historical trauma that arises from institutional racism and oppression and discriminatory systems and we also have to address address the individual trauma right we can't just think about this at a 50,000 foot level we also have to think about it at a five foot level and understand that we are contending with both. We're dealing with real people who were situated in real communities that have a history and context and policy decisions that have shaped all of them. And so if we're going about this only focusing on one or the other, we're kind of missing the mark. But of course, you know, I love this, this graphic because it's like, who wants change, right? All the hands are up. And then it's who wants to change? No hands are up. And then who wants to lead the change? And everybody is gone. Because honestly, that, that, that's the daunting part of all of this is, okay, now what do we do with this information? And it, it certainly is daunting. And I, I won't take that away from anyone or minimize, you know, just how overwhelming it can feel to recognize that all of these systems are, are tied together and all of them are just kind of recreating the same outcomes. But first and foremost, trauma has to be a priority, right? We have to consider people's emotional safety similar to their other basic needs uh, because we recognize that it's a risk factor for their behavioral, physical, and mental health outcomes, that, that all, all of these things are tied in together and that we have to really, really prioritize this in a way that we have not historically done. We also have to consider what's happened to individual and communities instead of just something being wrong with them, um, because that's that's really central to us coming to a better place. If we think that people are are you know are not worthy um, or there is something deficient in them, then we don't actually bother to to turn on our curiosity. We turn on our judgment, um, and our judgment does not often lead us to the best outcomes, especially when it comes to finding ways to be able to support people. It leads us to further punishing them as if they've done something wrong instead of thinking about what's been done to them and how we can support and protect them. So I, I shout out to the RISE Center for this because I really love um, the, this description because as I mentioned before, systems are designed and maintained or disrupted by people. Um, and that every other level of dehumanization sustains dehumanizing systems that have been put in place to contribute to institutional dehumanization. But the converse is true as well that every other level of liberation and healing sustains liberation and healing and can contribute to institutional liberation and healing. And so it's really easy to see ourselves as individuals rendering individual care to people, but that renders every interaction that we have as individual instead of systemic. Um, and that mindset can be extended to every sector, whether it's policing or education or whatever. So it's really important for us to like take a step back and realize that even in one-on-one -on -one situations, there's a power differential and that our individual actions comprise a collective that defines our institution and what, whatever system you're a part of. And so this adds a layer of gravity to our, our work, um, and that can certainly be intimidating. But this conception of ourselves and our work is essential to being able to really be change makers and really be disruptors. So one of the, the very concrete things that I like to leave people with is challenge yourself, right? Learn the story of your communities, because if you come into it thinking that, you know, I, I use this as an example all the time, you come into it thinking that people can't afford homes because, uh, because, you know, they just don't know how to manage their money, then you come up with a solution around how to ha create financial literacy workshops and te teach people how to spend their money. And if you realize that the reason people can't afford homes is because the housing prices are high and because they are not being paid a livable wage and because there's not been, you know, generation generational um, accumulation of wealth or even stability, right, in, in their communities, then you approach the problem a little differently. You realize that a financial literacy workshop is not going to help someone who simply doesn't have enough money to be able to survive because prices are high and they, and they have more months than money. And so then you start thinking about, well, what can we do differently? And we've seen that play out in things like universal basic income and other ways that we have begun to shift and think more about what's causing this, what is the actual need, as opposed to just addressing symptoms or having a short-sighted view. So I, I frequently, you know, remind people that the reason why I tell this story in this way and go back and tell history is because communities have a history and they're writing a story. And so your interaction continues a conversation that predates you, even when you're doing individual service work. And so it's really important to know it so you can recognize and preempt 
access barriers, concerns, fears, mistrust, questions, misconceptions, structural issues, right? Here, we're trying to learn compassion. We're trying to learn history. We're not trying to learn stereotyping. Um, so we, we are really trying to focus on what happened and how that may be influencing the things that are going to happen and that are happening now. We also want to challenge our work, right, to develop solutions. And so we really need to think about how good practices and policies must be institutionalized and sustainable. They cannot be, the, the, be just left to, you know, really altruistic people and really charismatic leaders. Because when those altruistic people and charismatic leaders retire, get a new job, et cetera, all the good work that they've been doing goes away. They, this needs to be institutionalized. This needs to be something that, it, that the torch is passed from person to person, no matter who occupies a role, there is a way that we go about doing things to be able to address. And we really need to be thinking about how do we address root causes? Even when we're doing response work, we need to be thinking about what are the other ways that we can invest in addressing root causes? We need to think about promoting healing. We, and we also need to think about preventing new harms and repairing past harms. Because if you don't do those things in concert, we will just continue to see the same outcomes recreated over and over again. And so I posed the question of like, what would this look like for housing and marijuana? And I, I answered it a bit in terms of, you know, some of the examples of how changing our understanding of, of the challenges around housing allows us to come up with different solutions, right? The same thing could be true for marijuana and that if we recognize the, the racist history of why marijuana, marijuana was criminalized so, so, you know, um, so, so, I guess strongly in the first place, then we're in a better position to be able to say, okay, what can we do to be able to repair harm in communities for people who were criminalized for a thing that is now legal? How do we allow them to be at the at the head of the line for establishing businesses and reaping profits, especially those who were criminalized for selling, when now we have entire industries and institutions that are being built to be able to capitalize on this rich and burgeoning economy. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we think about if we think about repairing past harms and preventing new harms and promoting healing in our communities. Um, because we go beyond just, okay, we did away with the policy, good, now we're not sending people to jail and prison or and or um, giving them felony convictions with no incarceration time for marijuana, but we actually go to the pace of how do we how do we address the people who were previously harmed and do right by them. And so that's my charge to you is to, to be thinking about that as you're implementing policies in within your institutions, as you're thinking about policy advocacy from a legislative perspective, is what do we do to repair and to prevent and to promote healing. And so I, I say challenge our lives, right? Challenge our work, challenge ourselves. Um, and what are we currently doing that we need to stop doing because it isn't working? What haven't we done that we need to start doing because it may work? And what are we already doing along this continuum that what we should continue doing because it works well? And there are obviously a ton of those things that are working well, but there's a lot of things that we need to stop and start doing so that we can really begin to address institutional racism and make our systems better. I always say to people, I don't want to make the same mistakes we made yesterday. We wake up today to make new mistakes um, and to make better mistakes. And so that's my charge to you. But my final charge to you is, of course, may the force be with you. So I am happy to take any questions that you may have for me at this time. Before we jump into our Q&A, can we all give uh, a round of applause to Dr. Flojan Kofer for such a powerful uh, presentation and sharing her wisdom and knowledge with us. So wherever you are, send some love, send some claps. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Flo. So with the Q&A session, I will pass it over to um, Melissa. Melissa will help me coordinate. If you all have any questions, just a gentle reminder to utilize the Q&A function box. If you're not uh, near a computer, um, please feel free, uh, not near your computer, near your chat box, uh, you could utilize the, the raise hand function and we could uh, allow you to speak and unmute you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so right now I don't see any questions, but we can give it a second and see if any come in or if anyone raises your, their hand, I can allow you to speak. Uh, we do have someone says, uh, Danica, thank you. She says, amazing presentation. I uh, learned a lot and the Star Wars analogy was very relatable and powerful. Thank you for your passion and time. Thank you for that comment. I really appreciate it. Uh, another one from Sophie. May the force be with you. 
Redlining is one of my favorite topics. Thank you for making it an essential part of your presentation. Thank you so much. And one of the things I actually didn't mention um, during the, the early part, since I, I see that we have a lot of comment, comments coming in, um, you know, is that, you know, the very first drug policy in the United States was actually um, targeted at um, our Chinese community here. Um, it was in California and it was around opium. Um, and so there's a long history of like drug policy just being uh, being driven by racism. Um, and I, I didn't, I failed to mention that when I was talking about even the precursor to the DEA because that was the late 1800s. And so the, the, we're just building on this idea of, you know, not being, we talk about being evidence-based, but our, our drug policy policy is anything but. Um, and if you div dig even deeper, it, it's, it's really, really quite insidious. Right. From Eugenia, thank you for your very informative lecture. What changes, has, what changes have worked so far in tiers of legislation? Yeah, that's a great question, Eugenia. Um, one of the things that, you know, we've seen is, is not just rescinding bad policy, but actually putting into place um, good policy, right? <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's not just not just defense, but actually good offense. Um, and so, so you know, I, I use Prop 64 as just an example of we did away with the criminalization, but the equity protections that were included in it were, you know, I think could have gone further. Um, so, you know, there's money that was given to the governor's office of business and economic development to be able to issue community grants, but a large portion of the dollars are just going to cities and, and um, throughout the state um, and counties throughout the state. And unfortunately, because there were no protections around that, a lot of that money is going to, um, to law enforcement, um, right? And so the very entity that's responsible for the, the you know, the, the racist way in which the drug policy was played out and also was almost uniformly against the decriminalization of marijuana. So you get to be against it, you get to be res responsible for the, the racism and how it was implemented. And then you also get to be the primary um, you know, financial beneficiary. So those are the kinds of things that we need to think about in advance of not just rescinding a policy, but actually doing, um, doing the real work of protection. And I think, you know, unfortunately what what often happens is we do that first and then we try to come back and do clean up afterward and so there's there's not really a good example of us doing it all up front and i think that's where political will and better conversations come in because we're so busy always trying to do you know harm reduction that i don't think we've actually more broadly taken the stance uh you know in advance of okay when we do this here are all the things we need to have in place so we don't create another you know another system right that is that is inequitably um, you know, inequitable from the start. Uh, Robin, I'm glad we are finally having a convo about DPH, Oak Park, et cetera, especially the house fine problem. Yep, absolutely. Yes, there, there's, there's a lot of like, the myth, right? Similar to our drug policy, like there's a lot of myth that exists around why things are the way that they are, right? If you were to ask people, people would say, well, we look for drugs in black and brown communities because that's use who's using drugs, right? We we're offering financial literacy programs because if people knew how to spend their money, they'd spend it better and they'd be able to have money to buy homes. I mean, you even see it generationally, right? If you millennials would stop buying your avocado toast, you could have what we had, never mind the, the vast disparity in what things cost when baby boomers were coming along versus what's happening with with millennials right so you know we have to get back to like what's really happening and not the myth of of what we think is happening a, a very uninformed dialogue we actually need to get back to, to like what really happened and what are we seeing and how does this play out and what should we do about it and it's unfortunate because I think sometimes even people who are evidence-based and science-driven and really want to know what happened still fall prey to the socialization of these narratives. And so it's important that we counter those narratives um, in our work and that we question our assumptions. All right, we are, we got two minutes left. So let's try, we have a couple questions left. Um, next one, I've been seeing where several minorities either have the down payment, but they don't have the correct credit. So what do we do with this? 
I wish we had more time because, you know, one of the, one of the terrible things is even the down payment, right? It only exists so that banks get to cover their own losses and make sure that if you default in the first couple of years, they don't lose money, but they're billion dollar institutions. And I work every day for my money. And it seems to me like you'd be much less likely for me to lose my home if you let me keep my money. Um, so that when, you know, I lose my job during a pandemic, of, you know, that I'm able to continue paying, right. And able to maintain my housing instead of handing over my life savings in a lump sum to a bank that doesn't need this money so that they can cover their costs. So, you know, credit is one of those things where, again, you know, most people have been paying somebody's mortgage their whole life. It's either their own or it's their landlords. And so the idea that that doesn't count towards your ability to buy a home, that you are paying more in rent, but you don't qualify for a lower amount for your, for your mortgage payment is just absurd. And so there are a lot of ways that the system is set up to basically, you know, just dis disincentivize um, home ownership for people who don't have a lump sum of cash and really to create, you know, a, a, a financial disparity um, between communities. And so, yeah, I mean, there, there's so many things that we could do about it, but you're, you're highlighting one of the major challenges, which is that we prioritize business needs over human needs and we don't really treat housing as a human right. Um, and so to Eugenia, you know, like there, there are programs that exist. There are far too few of them. And, you know, there's a, the, the challenge of homelessness is built into the title. People need homes um, and they need homes that they can, can access. And if housing is a human right, then that should not be something that is subject to market whims. It should be something that is afforded to people. You should not have to qualify into a human right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cover. This has been amazing. Thank you for everyone for attending and we really appreciate you and thank you so much for your time. Thank you.